Watch this. Change can be difficult for some people. We're seeing a good example of that in this session's budgeting committee. After trying to adjust how they allocate taxpayer money, some lawmakers have sabotaged the process in an effort to return to the old ways. So which one will it be? From budgets to birth control, there's a new bill trying to extend contraception prescriptions to six months instead of three. And maybe this one has some momentum after five tries. I really liked the game to start out with, but the competition kind of gave me more of a reason to play more. In just five years, a Boise teenager has taken bonding time with his dad to an attempt at an international title. <sighs> yes, he sure plays a mean pinball. Okay, so I guess fifth time might be the charm. Legislation dating back to Democratic Senator Sheree Buckner Webb about six sessions ago. It's getting another run at the State House, and for the third time, it's coming through Democratic Senator Melissa Wintrow. The plan is, or the hope, is to increase women's access to birth control pills. And right now, insurance companies in Idaho will only reimburse one to three months, max. Well, she wants to extend that window up to half a year, which Andrew Bartline learned is a significant compromise from where this bill started years ago. Once you start looking, the countdowns are all around. Anywhere you look. We're busy. Even where you work. And I'm very hopeful this time that we're gonna get it through to help women in our state. Democratic Senator Melissa Wintrow yeah. has her eyes set on an extension. It's basically just to expand access to birth control. Currently, insurance companies in Idaho typically reimburse one to three months supply of birth control at a time. Wintrow wants to regulate the industry to a six month standard. This is the lightest touch, directing a company to do what they're already doing, but just give us a few more pill packets, right? Think of this legislation like it's a parking meter. Now it wouldn't tell you where you can park, how you can park it, wouldn't even tell you what you can drive. But as is, you have to come back and feed the meter every two hours. Wintrow's bill wants to extend that limit. If you direct them to do it, and they all have to, that's the stability of the marketplace. That creates fairness, and that keeps the cost down. But some lawmakers say the clock isn't theirs to manage. Yes, indeed, it is a light touch, and I, I appreciate that. But when it comes to government intrusion in the private sector, there shouldn't be any touch. It's not a you can't have access, it's not covered, it's we want you to do more. And I think this is something that the private sector should handle and not have the government direct it. Through four previous attempts to recalibrate the contraceptive clock, Wintrow's been addressing concerns one by one. Well, 12 months was too much. There might be waste or so forth. So I modified it to bring it down to six. At least twice a year is better than every month. That will help. The bill also carves out first time prescriptions. It allows physicians to use their discretion for a smaller supply. I'm happy to put that in. Considering the current state law, it bans abortion except for rape with a police report, incest, or a doctor's decision to prevent the death of the mother, doctors supported the bill in testimony. Right now, Idaho women and their health care providers need a lifeline. And so the most effective way to reduce abortion rates is to prevent unintended pregnancy. And we can do that by improving access to consistent, effective, and affordable contraception. Wintrow still considers the count too quick. Our pharmacy laws allow us to go up to 13. And with the bill waiting in the wings on the Senate floor, she's counting down to for the fifth time total. Third time for me, and you know, it's one, two, three, four is the number, so I'm hoping that's gonna bring us luck. Wintrow and another member of that committee said separately that insurance companies that provide coverage in Idaho are remaining neutral on this bill. Senator James Ruckty also offered a response to the senators who say the state should not be involved in the private insurance industry, that they shouldn't regulate it. Ruckty pointed out the Idaho Department of Insurance exists where their entire job is to regulate insurance companies. That bill, though, Brian, narrowly escaped that committee, if that's the right language. It was like five to three, yeah. one person absent. So it'll be interesting to see what happens once it gets to the Senate floor. It did get held today, so 
I don't want to make assumptions, but a lot of times that's people trying to figure out if this is going to get through or not and, and it, doing work behind the scenes. If I remember correctly, the first time it was brought up back in 2018, it was that 12 months, but they wanted it because there's a lot of remote areas of Idaho and some people who live there can't always get to the doctor and to the pharmacist as often as they'd like. Yeah, that's a big piece of it too. And then through COVID, that was another piece, True. obviously a little different now, but access, waiting in lines, it was a whole thing. All right. Thanks, Andrew. I think that getting those budgets started on the front end will help people see them, understand them better, and get us out of here earlier, too. A lot of times we get at the end of the session and stuff's getting passed and thrown out some of those budgets that we don't understand. Okay, so the legislative leaders of the Joint Finance Appropriations Committee came into this session with a new idea on how to pass state agencies' budgets. Right. They wanted to simplify it instead of having to sit through countless days of three-hour meetings about money. Well, the idea of passing maintenance budgets, like skeleton budgets, they were called, has turned to kind of a bit of a nightmare now that they have to come back and readdress these requests and these line items. Well, apparently the change in process has not been received well by several members of the committee and the majority party. To be fair, this JFAC process, Joe, has been kind of like flying a plane while still building it, but yeah. you can keep your Boeing 737 jokes. But Joe, this has kind of actually been like, some of the pilots have different blueprints for this plane. And it's interesting too, because Brian, I walked into the Capitol with our photojournalist, Jason Foster, a random person came up to me and said, what are you here covering? He said, we're here to cover the budgeting process. And she said, oh, well, it only took 20 some years to make JFAC and budgeting exciting. <laughs> And it's a little too exciting if you ask some members of JFAC. Here's why. On Friday, there was a sudden change of format. Budgets being passed according to essentially the older process. And one group of lawmakers, they knew the plan going into Friday. The others realized what has happened during the budget meeting. Here's what lawmakers have to say. After beginning the legislative session with the new budgeting procedure, a sudden change was made this past Friday in the Joint Finance and Appropriations Committee. A group of lawmakers brought budgets using the former process. It was a process vote. That's what it really was, because we were doing one, one type of work here, and they were going a totally different direction. JFAC co-chairs, Representative Wendy Horman and Senator Scott Grow, now have a new challenge to navigate. Budgets created with two different processes. Uncertainty. Anytime you have change, there's uncertainty, and people are uncomfortable with that. They're comfortable with the way it's happened previously. They know how that works. They're not quite sure how this one's working, and so it gets, gets them a little disconcerted, and they uh, start to kind of pull back a little bit. Senator Janie Ward Engelking, along with 11 other lawmakers, brought new budgets to committee out of concerns about that new process. Some of us made sure that we took our names off the other budgets, and we, um, we recreated what we believe are truly maintenance budgets. Senator Ward Engelking says it comes down to things missing from budgets that she and others believe should be in the so-called maintenance budgets. We'd been working all week on them. I don't, I mean, nobody was surprised that we were bringing alter, alternative budgets. I think they were surprised that we put everything in the budget that needed to be there for maintenance. Unbeknownst to some of us, there was a group that decided they wanted to go back to last year's budgeting method. And the rest of us figured that out pretty quickly. So we knew that's what was up. Nobody else in the room would have known that. Senator Scott Herndon supports the new process as a member of JFAC. He believes it digs deeper into budgets. We never really scrutinize it. We only look at 19% of the total budget on average every year. So 81% were pretty much just rubbing, rubber stamping year over year. And this new method would allow us in the interim between sessions to dive down into the base budgets, and really keep these two pieces separate. What I say is I'm now able to vote in support of the Idaho State Police, for example, but maybe I don't want to buy their new helicopter, which would be the line item. Now I can have two different votes on those two different issues. A lot of this comes down to a hypothetical question that is floating out there. What if lawmakers pass maintenance budgets and then simply don't come back to add supplemental funding, therefore they shortchange agencies and programs? Well, JFAC's co-chairs say that is not their end game. First, the law requires that we consider all the agency requests and the governor's requests. We will go through thoroughly and consider everything by law that we're required to do. So that's kind of a strongman argument that we're going to pass those and go home. We're, we're not going to do that. I think they haven't looked at our calendar. They haven't looked at what we've scheduled to do. It's on the schedule. We intend to evaluate all of those as we have in the past, but separately. 
So this is a very complex and evolving situation, and here's the latest for you here at 508. The Idaho House was supposed to take up appropriation budgets today, essentially giving lawmakers a referendum on what process they want to use. So the House began their session at 11. They quickly broke, though, to meet with their respective parties in private caucus meetings, and those meetings went on for nearly two hours, Brian. So lawmakers didn't vote on the budgets today. They ran out of time. They were debating behind closed doors about how they want to proceed on all of this. It's a very important process and a very, you know, intricate conversation. I am told, though, from several sources inside the state house that the Idaho House will take up these uh, appropriations tomorrow on the floor. I'm also told into the afternoon and evening there is continuing caucus meetings. So okay. we'll kind of see how this all falls. And again, I want to really put out a disclaimer. This is a very complicated topic, so there's going to be a lot of nuance and stuff that is outside of what you just saw and we'll continue to follow that for you. So basically there if there are two budgets that have been passed for one agency, that's how they're going to handle it. They'll take up one and just ditch the other one. That, that's a great question. We don't know. Okay. It's possible that if they pass one, the other one's dead. They can bring one. There's a lot of levers that can be pulled here. So we'll find out and a lot of time left. Well, maybe j we'll back's exciting again. It's exciting again ever. Was it ever? Now it is it's exciting now. All right. Thanks, Joe. They used to be the least played games at the arcade, but pinball has seen a resurgence recently, and with it, a younger demographic of players. We meet Idaho's latest champion, raising the bar without being old enough to get into a bar. Then again, age is just a number. This is also just a number, but not just any number. It's the number to text your take on the 208 to be part of the show, 208-321-5614. As always, include your name and the hashtag, the 208. Clean, concise, and clever, that's the key to getting your text seen by everyone else. One of the men killed in the hangar collapse up by the Boise Airport shares their grief in today's 411. Here's Abby Davis. Today, we talked to the uncle of 24 year old Mariano Kokoch, who died in the Jackson jet hangar collapse last Wednesday. Emilio Tech says Mariano was from Guatemala and living in Nampa for about a year. He says Mariano has family in Guatemala, including a daughter. Emilio says they are raising money to send Mariano's body back to Guatemala. Thomas Creech's lawyers filed a new federal complaint to try to delay his execution scheduled for the 28th. Creech's team says state prosecutors violated his constitutional rights by convicting him of a cold case murder without any proof, and possibly giving up evidence that might not have ever existed in the case that landed him on death row, including a picture of a sock with Creech's name on it, allegedly used as a weapon in the killing of fellow inmate David Jensen in 1981. They say the sock in the picture does not appear to match the sock in the official crime scene photos. Creech's team is asking for a stay on his execution, 
and a new clemency hearing to possibly change his death sentence based on what they're calling misconduct by the state. Fundamentally, this is about protecting the public and protecting election integrity. House Bill 426 requires AI-generated election ads within state-defined electioneering windows to be clearly labeled. But that bill was sent back to the House State Affairs Committee after being held on the House floor for over a week. That's the 411 on the 208. I'm Abby Davis. Well, we want to talk about the amount of rain that we've had for the beginning of the water year, which starts in the uh, beginning of October, runs through the beginning of October of next year. And we're doing really well so far. Of course, we don't have, this is a video in the background. Of course, that's not what's going on right now. We do have rain, but not that heavy and snow mixed in with it. But have you noticed October was about an inch and a quarter? I'll just round these out. Close to an inch and a quarter for November. December was about an inch and a half. And here's January with about two and a quarter inches of rain. Uh, with all of this, if you add it up, it's close to six inches. Where are we at? Five inches is the average, so we're above that. And as we started the month of February, as you know, uh, we're well above average right now with over an inch of rain that we've been receiving. So, so far, it's so good. As you look past the two weeks, though, and also added to this are these kind of nice temperatures, as you've noticed. I remember this one, don't you? It's last Wednesday, and then they're coming down just a bit, but we still have most of those temperatures into the 40s. So it's raining outside. Now, as you look at the rain coming in, uh, you can see some darker areas pulling to the south and to the west. Meridian getting just a little heavier rain shower through there. And as you look here to the northwest, one thing to see, storm systems moving up like the interstate from the east right through here for tonight. This storm is coming in. It's got cooler air. 
You're going to see that in the seven day forecast and it's pushing in, which is keeping this storm system from moving westward through the entire valley. As you get toward Caldwell, the rain showers are pretty much on the decrease, so there's really not a lot out there. And if you look at this in the future cast, it shows the rain overnight. Here it is overnight trying to push in and then pulling to the north. So there'll still be some more rain showers, maybe a tenth of an inch instead of previously thought about the heavier rain. Tomorrow will be gusty after those showers. I think they'll stop early in the morning. If anything, there'll be a few sprinkles and then we'll see the same thing for Thursday and Friday. But Friday morning, watch this one. There's a chance of some snow Friday morning. Not a lot, but that's in your morning commute there. OK, we'll keep you informed rest of the week as we get into the weekend and next week. Just some cooler temperatures, but we're back to some sunshine. All right, what's old is new again. Think vinyl, mom jeans, fanny packs. Well, the same can be said of pinball. The old arcade standard, first introduced and electrified in the 1930s, peaked in the 1950s, but whose popularity plummeted after the invention of video games in the 1970s. The game, though, is getting more pub these days, and not just in pubs. Fewer than 20 years ago, there were only about 500 competitive pinball players fighting it out with flippers in about 50 competitions across the country. Today, those numbers are in the tens of thousands, and one of them will be representing Idaho in a battle to be the best on the continent. Arcades are in the business of selling nostalgia. It's where what you remember as a kid is revived. Arcades were a big thing. I remember getting quarters and going to the arcade to play Street Fighter 2. <laughs> or Joust, or Donkey Kong, or going berserk for asteroids, where the joy of something generational is bridged to the next. And perhaps no game narrows that gap. No, we, we had Nintendo. <laughs> more than the classic pinball. Not so much. It was more like my dad's thing. It did for Lucas Silvers. He'd still be on the same game, playing for free, because you can get a replay. Where, in order to get more money for video games, he'd have to play a game of pinball with his dad. He'd kick my butt, he'd give me a few more quarters, and the cycle would kind of continue. And that was my arcade experience as a child, so it was pretty fun. And now, the adrenaline rush of the silver ball. There's a lot of flashing lights and, and noises, and it, it just stimulates all my senses all at once. It's shared between another generation of silvers. I always just found it fun, you know. That fun became competitive when Lucas signed Zyron up for his first tournament five years ago. He finished fourth. Yeah, yeah, I was right there to, next to that top three. So he was like, he was hooked from the get-go, so yeah. Yeah, hooked instantly. I'm, I'm always been kind of competitive. It's that competitive spirit that kept the teenager coming back to the arcade at least twice a week for four or five hours at a time to practice. Oh. Where repetition is really the only way to become a wizard. Yeah, I know, I know the machines pretty well. But standing like a statue, not really an option for Zyron. There's a lot of, you know, energy I have in me that I, you know, so yeah, I just kind of, without really thinking about it, I'm just moving all around. About the only thing that seems still in here might be Zyron's mind. But inside his head, it's all about what's going on inside the game. How does the ball come out of that feed? You know, do I need to nudge it a little bit as it's coming out to keep it more safe? I like how there's like infinite variation. Yeah, that's what's cool about it is you kind of get to choose your path. The path Zyron wanted to follow was the one to champion. And now you are. Yeah. Crowned last month at the Idaho State Tournament. That last round, it went to seven games. It's all the way and that last game was a nail biter and he did it and it was pretty exciting. The exhilaration on his face, you know, the, the accomplishment of, I finally did it. It was a proud papa moment for sure. And next month, Zyron will take his talents to the next level. We get to play against the best players in the world. Competing in the North American Pinball Championship. A pretty good path for what started out as just time together. Yeah, very much so. For a father and son. Pinball champion. Yeah, it's kind of weird, <laughs> but it's cool. Yeah, pinball's, pinball's my jam. And that jam seems to be getting to the younger generation. Five of the top 16 pinball players at Idaho's championships were under the age of 25. Zyron is going to compete in that one-day tournament next month in Wisconsin. His goal, he told us, is to beat at least one top-ranked player at that tournament. Stringing a couple together, though, and he could take home a piece of that $40,000 in cash and prizes that's up for grabs. The 18-year-old is also hoping for some financial help to get there, though. He has a GoFundMe set up, and you can find a link in this story at KTVB.com.
All right, we're going to start out with the comments, a couple of comments actually about the gentleman who passed away with the hangar collapsing. This one from Bob. I got another one besides this one, but Bob says, I see that the family's trying to get the loved one sent back home. I think the company he worked for should do that out of respect. Don't know if that's possibly or if that's happening or not. As a former budget analyst for JFAC, I thought the budgeting process was very exciting already, says Ray in Boise. There might be five of you out there that think that. <laughs> The majority party has a problem with government involvement with private insurance companies, but apparently no issue at all with involvement in women's rights, says Jack in Boise and this sentiment shared by others. I know legislation is worried. Legislature is worried about giving birth control for six months because they don't want the government involved, but they have no problem being involved in personal decisions on, say, abortion. Hypocrites one and all, says Judy. Brian, just like most of your stories, you're making a controversy out of nothing. People can get three months of birth control with an additional three refills without going back to the doctor, just like I get my blood pressure meds, says Dave Allen or Dallin in Boise. Says, but not one of your regulars, you won't put this on. Well, let's see. I did. And secondly, I guess it depends on the insurance company. I'm not all familiar with all the insurance companies out there, but the whole point of this was to kind of make it uniform for everybody so they can do that. That's the last one for today. You know what? We're going to try to tackle some more of these for tomorrow, and we'll be back then to do that. Thanks for watching. If you miss any part of this show, you can catch it on our YouTube channel, The 208. It's always there. We'll see you tomorrow.